way we grow and produce food is ever-changing, shaped by consumers and the climate in which we live and farm. Research at all points of our food system is essential for continuously improving food's journey from farm to table. The Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange explores timely research innovations and applications that make our food system better than ever. Join us for today's podcast. Welcome to the Manitoba Agriculture and Food Knowledge Exchange podcast. I'm your host, Jordan Sisiwa, and today we are talking about pollinators and pollinator habitat. Specifically, we're going to focus right in on bees and what they do for the environment and how farmers and producers can support them in all the excellent things that they do at the backbone of food production. So, of course, with everything that we do, we went to go get some experts and both of our experts can be found in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences at the University of Manitoba. First, we've got Dr. Yvonne Lawley, and she's the Assistant Professor in the Plant Science Department at the University of Manitoba. She's an expert in cropping system design. Next, we got Dr. Jason Gibbs, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Entomology. He's an expert in the diversity of wild bees in North America. Both of them are going to be chatting quite a bit, so let's jump right into this. Dr. Gibbs, what makes bees so beneficial? Well, bees are the primary pollinators of flowering plants. Um, A lot of different insects will visit plants to collect, uh, to eat pollen, to drink nectar, Uh, but bees are really the only insects that actually entirely use pollen and nectar for their entire food supply. Um, so bees are very effective, they're very efficient, and they visit flowers a lot. Um, the benefit of that is that all those plants are things that we eat, all those plants are you know, sequestering carbon, they're releasing oxygen, uh, they're sort of the basis of you know, ecosystem generally. And so bees are this kind of eco, uh, keystone uh, group of insects that are sort of benefiting you know, ecosystems broadly. I, I love that because it is, you know, you see these, uh, talking to somebody that loves to go out and, and hike, you see bees bouncing from flower to flower. Their life seems pretty good. And as small as they are, like you said, they're the, the cornerstone to most ecosystems. Now, when, when we take that into account, why is their habitat important? Well, bees need basically three things. They need flowers that they can use to sort of feed their offspring. They need a place to nest, and they need a safe place where they're not going to get killed, basically. (laughs) Um, And so having habitat on the landscape is really important to sort of sustain bees. And not necessarily, they're not always the same habitat. So sometimes the places where they nest are not the same places where they forage for, for flowers. Interesting. Now, let, let's talk a little bit about the, the farming side of this, because this is something I, I think, I, I know personally, as I'm driving down the highway, you'll see boxes or beehives once in a while. What what do farmers typically do with, with bees? Well, I think um, in Manitoba, anyway, uh, or on the prairies, we have specialization in terms of the farmers that are working with bees, and then the farmers that maybe some of their crops get serviced by bees. And so I think, you know, the general farmer in Manitoba may not be, especially if we're talking about grain crops, they may not be thinking too much about bees. But we have some farmers, and a lot of farmers in Manitoba, whose bread and butter is bees. And uh, and they're looking for places where those bees can forage. Um, I think for those farmers, they're looking for flowering plants at critical times in the year. So if we take a look at the crops that we commonly grow in Manitoba, we have both cereal crops and then we have sort of these broadleaf crops that tend to have more flowers. So the cereal crops, if half of our rotation is in those cereal crops, you know, half of the landscape, half of the agricultural landscape is in providing that habitat for, or forage, I guess, for bees to feed. So if we look at then those broadleaf crops in rotation, only some of them are really good providers. Probably the most familiar crop that we have across the prairies is canola. And it is a really good source of forage for, uh, for bees, but they're only blooming for a certain number of weeks out of the whole growing season. And so 
you know, farmers who work with bees are really looking for um, the flowers early in the season and then late into the season. And Jason works with wild bees as well. So those bees are foraging for themselves and we also need habitat that provides those resources through that entire growing season. Let's talk about that a little more because I know you, you had mentioned when we were chatting off air that there's there's a difference between honeybees that, that I, and I, I grew up in a small town where I actually worked in apiaries my whole life and I didn't I didn't realize, and I don't know why, because I've seen bees nowhere near bad kind, <laughs> and I've seen bees completely in a man-made contained unit. So let's talk a little bit about wild bees. Yeah, so wild bees are native to Manitoba. We have somewhere about around 360 species in the province, and a lot of them are actually solitary. They don't have these sort of complex societies like honeybees do. They don't move, they don't make honey. Generally speaking, they don't sting very often or at all. And they just sort of live their life and they sort of collect pollen and nectar and they sort of provide for their, their nests. And there's, there's sort of the, the free sort of pollination service that's out there. They're pollinating all the wild plants and they're visiting some of the crops. And they're doing a lot of pollination for us, but a lot of that just kind of goes under the radar. Honeybees are actually European species and you know, obviously they make honey, which we love to eat. But they're also incredibly important for agriculture because they're the only kind of bee that you can kind of spontaneously move from one spot to the other and get pollination on a large scale when you need. We also have uh, leafcutter bees uh, in Manitoba, which are used to pollinate uh, some crops like alfalfa. But generally speaking, those are the only two sort of managed pollinators that we can use on a large scale. But all the, all the wild bees are out there in the background and they're doing work and they're everywhere. They're in your lawn, I can almost guarantee it. But we generally don't see them. So right now, I don't know if you can tell by my face, but I'm completely <laughs> fascinated. 360 different varieties of, of bees in Manitoba. Yeah, that's, uh, we're, so we're actively sort of figuring that out. So when I started at the U of M three years ago, there was only about 230 species that were known for the province. So there's a huge amount of diversity that people just haven't been noticing. Basically that's because there wasn't people looking. Um, so, but now that we're here and now that there are students sort of doing research on, on wild bees in the province, we're finding all kinds of interesting uh, uh, records. Some of these bees are you know, very different from the sort of thing that you might expect to be, to, to be like. Interesting. I'm loving this because I'm so, I'm a proud Manitoban, been here my whole life and and, and right now to have never known, uh, you know, if you had have said there was five different types of bees, I'd have been like, I still don't believe you. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but yeah. I think most people are familiar with bumblebees. Uh, they're pretty fuzzy and, and large. Yeah. We actually have 29 different kinds of bumblebees. And it depends on, you know, you, you can't see them all in one place. So some of them you'd have to go up to Churchill to see because they, they sort of are found in different locations, but you know, there's a, at least a dozen species that you can sort of find in a, in a given day if you look really hard. And you have to look really hard, and that's the point, I guess, is, is taking it all in and knowing what you're looking for. What do we need to know about creating habitats for bees and beneficial insects in Manitoba? I mean, uh, I'd say that, you know, it's, it's easier and cheaper to keep habitat than it is to make habitat. So if there's you know, shelter belts, you know, riparian areas, sort of wild spots, sloughs, sloughs you know, leave, leave those, leave those if you can, and they will sort of provide habitat for bees and other beneficial insects. And then, you know, alternatively, if you don't have those spots, if there are patches of land that, you know, aren't productive, aren't being used, you know, simply planting flowers is something that can be effective. Native plants are always, generally speaking, better for native bees. But if you're really interested in honeybees, then you know certain things, certain clovers and things like that are known to be really good for them. But that's something that basically anyone can do. So, you know, if you have a, a meter square piece of lawn that you're not using, plant it with some flowers, and that's going to benefit bees. And that's just something that every single one of us can do. Not not just not just the farming community who can acres and acres 
of this or, or like we were saying the, the sloughs because mm -hmm. if you've been on a farm you've seen those areas and that's what we avoid yeah <laughs> typically but but making that a beneficial habitat is that is that simple to do like do, do you just leave it alone well there's a couple of yeah there's a couple of different ways to approach it one is to kind of let it go fallow and just kind of let it do its own thing um and the seed bank will kind of take care of that i, I suppose yvonne probably knows more about that than i do uh, but the other the other approach is to take you know a more active uh, strategy in which you sort of you, you sort of seed it down with sort of plants that you think would be beneficial. If it has a flower, it's probably useful. <laughs> so and so speak to that a little bit more of of, of creating a, a useful little habitat for our bee friends. Yeah. So one of the reasons that we're talking about pollinator habitats on this podcast is we have a project started in Manitoba to try and document, you know, if you are going to take this effort to create this habitat or enhance this habitat on a farm landscape, what is its impact? And I think that's really important um, to have an intention for that area. We've talked about sort of areas that aren't being used within the farm or within a field that are less productive. And, and I think instead of thinking about that area as you know, a negative, um, an unproductive area, we can rethink that area and think about what other services that area can provide to the whole ecosystem that supports the crops that we're trying to grow and manage as, as farmers um, and as human beings, because we need those products from agriculture to feed ourselves. Um, so we need, we can be intentional about those areas that we want to create. And we've started this project to try and quantify in Manitoba what impact uh, those habitats can have if we take this intentional approach um, to designing a farm landscape that has space for pollinators. When we sat down and figured out, okay, what are we going to do with our habitat uh, areas with the farmers that we're collaborating? We have 15 different fields that we're following in Manitoba, so it's quite an extensive collaboration with farmers. Um, we had a few things that we wanted to um, do with these habitats. So one is we wanted to get flowers started right away and so we look to annual species that we know when we plant them in the ground they're going to grow and they're going to flower right away. But then thinking about that uh, community of plants over time we wanted to include some perennial species that we knew would you know if we plant them once then they'll hopefully overwinter and keep flowering. The other thing that perennial plants can bring is if they are already established, then they usually start flowering earlier in the season, and some of them can flower later into the season than many of the annual plants uh, do. So we wanted to have a community of plants that had perennials in it, and as Jason mentioned, there are different kinds of perennial plants as well. There are native perennials, and then there's sort of the perennials that we've domesticated as agricultural forage crops. <coughs> so some of the different species that we included in our pollinator mix were for the annuals, buckwheat and sunflower, and uh, a very beautiful plant with purple flowers called phacelia that might be a little less common, but bees really love phacelia. <laughs> if you want to talk about a plant that's buzzing, it's, it's phacelia. And then um, some of the, uh, like the domesticated perennial species, like Jason, Jason had mentioned clovers, we included some alfalfa, some Persian clover, and uh, interesting uh, biennial plant that grows for a two-year cycle that's called chicory. Um, we also had some native species um, like the purple and white prairie clover um, and then we also had a few grasses, perennial native grasses like little blue stem and blue grama and one of the reasons that we, you know, as I mentioned earlier, grasses don't flower but they provide important habitat, um, the protection, the coverage that will hopefully um, provide those spaces, especially for many of those native bees that might be ground burying to give them uh, the habitat that they need for the rest of their lives. Fascinating. So, so let me recap this. Is, is basically the study or the work that, that, that you guys are doing is to intentionally go to farmers and say, can we create the the habitat and see what works best 
I'm sorry if I'm reading into this too much, but then with the decision being, now we can make this available to all farmers in Manitoba to say, here's what we know. These grasses, these plants, more bees. Is that kind of the extent of this? I think that's really the hypothesis we want to test is if we can establish this habitat, you know, we know from other areas of North America that they've done work and found positive benefits to pollinators and beneficials. If we take this here to the prairies, do we have those same impacts here? I think some of the questions that are going to flow out of this project is how do we make this manageable for farmers who are managing a lot of other things on their farm? How do we make it accessible? Um, and so I think there'll be more questions that this one experiment generates. I guess that's that's the typical thing with all experiments is right is is if you've done it right, you should get a couple answers, but you get a lot more questions, and that's I guess that's what we're. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that sort of I mean, we're focused on bees to a certain extent, but there's also a lot of other beneficial types of insects. So there are insects, of course, that feed on crops, and we don't like those. Uh, but there's a lot of insects that actually feed on those pests. Uh, and so we're also monitoring these habitats to see whether or not they're changing the abundance of those beneficial predatory insects. Um, and you know we're collaborating with other people in the in the faculty to make sure that there aren't any negative side effects of these plantings. We don't want you know, weeds to sort of pop up in, in farmers' fields. So we're sort of monitoring these for sort of multiple uh, benefits. Um, but then you know we expect that as this sort of progresses, we're going to learn you know. You know, which plants didn't actually come up, you know, mm -hmm. which plants are not uh, as attractive to bees as other plants. Uh, and so we'll, you know, we're sort of working towards figuring out how to sort of improve uh, sort of the selection of those plants to benefit farmers, as Yvonne said, to make it more, to, to make it easier for farmers to actually implement this in practice. We're trying to learn the mistakes uh, in the project so they don't have to. Outstanding. You know what? This has been this is fascinating, and I appreciate both of you giving me your time because this is this is exactly what I love to hear about. Is there is a uh, solution based approach to making sure that the environment, the Manitoba, my home, my environment is being taken care of, and I so I appreciate this work for that reason, and I I can't wait to get back in and and, and hear about. The results of this and see what you guys come up with for for farmers and and for all the producers that do tune into this keep an eye out on this this work because it's gonna it definitely will change the, the landscape of manitoba and making it a, a better environment for those insects that we want around so to both of you dr yvonne dr jason thank you for your time and we'll talk again soon thank you.